a source that I found particularly interesting, um, partly because I used to be a columnist at the New Statesman, is is the collection of letters uh, from New Statesman readers talking mm. about in response yes. to some article about uh, homosexuality, and they they reveal a very um, quite measured opinions uh, um, among members of the public. And the one one thing that really stood out to me is that pe- more reasonable people tended to view sort of steady relationships, let's say, um, what's sometimes quite charmingly referred to as living as married kind of relationships as um, sort of fine, you know, people keep themselves to themselves. But there was a degree to which people saw um, prostitution, uh, sex in public places and the legal status of homosexuality as kind of the same issue and also of co- and also um, very young men, even adolescents, selling sex to older men. Th- th- that was a kind of a bundle of issues. And to some extent, what 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 um, gay campaigners managed to do direct successfully was to disentangle that bundle and to say, no, actually, people having same sex relationships is not necessarily the same thing as these other concerns that people have. Do you think? Do you think is that an accurate representation of how the debate went? I think that that's that's very accurate. Yes, and I I think um, it has to be said that the New Statesman and um, the Spectator, generally the editorially took a very liberal view and both thought that the the law should be changed. And not all their readers agreed. So you do get these debates within the letters columns. Um, the campaigners, I mean, modern um, sort of modern gay historians have been. I think they're a bit hard on people like Peter Wildblood, who who was involved in the Lord Montague of Bewley case and went to jail. And then he wrote a book called Against the Law about his experiences in which he said, I am homosexual, and this is what it's like, and this one. And um, he, he's, he sort of says, you know, we want, we want proper respect, um, not for the sort of the mincing, painted boys who wander up and down the streets. And some contemporary historians say, you know, Oh, you know, stuffy old queen. You know, what about you know the 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 outrageous people like Quentin Chris? Well, they have a point, but of course, it was they were merely being pragmatic. I think that one way to persuade politicians and and the, the public at large that homosexuality was there was nothing the matter with it was to say that actually a lot of homosexuals you meet in the streets you wouldn't know they were homosexual. They live quiet lives with another man at home. Um, they 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 act exactly the same as heterosexuals, and of course that was a lot easier to present as the as it were the acceptable face of homosexuality. But I think you know that was a a, a very sensible tactic um, because in the in the press in the tabloid press you know every time homosexuality was mentioned you know you'd always get painted faces picking up boys prostitution as you say th- those sort of things. Um, and uh, and obviously that didn't give um, a very good uh, you know promiscuity. A lot of people didn't like it anyway, regardless of whether it was heterosexual or homosexual. And there's someone, um, I think a parliamentarian, I can't remember now who it was, who said, "Well, look, you know, actually looked upon uh, objectively, the sexual act is not terribly pretty, whether it involves men and women or two men." And, you know, we need to, to get away from that and to think more about the the actual, um, as it were, love between people. Um, uh, but, uh, of course, you know, sensationalist press wanted to, to talk about, you know, the, the less um, publicly acceptable um, attitudes, to, uh, examples of homosexuality. But of course, it could it could equally be argued that the reason men were having sex in the park was that, you know, there was nowhere else for them to go. You know, they couldn't necessarily take someone back. They might be living with a landlady or, you know, in digs or something. And so it wasn't easy. Um, and I think that most people who had sex in parks, you know, were pretty discreet, <laughs> found the thickest bushes they could. Um, though, of course, some of them did get caught, including Ian Harvey, the Conservative MP, caught with a guardsman in St. James's Park. Um but um, I, I think it's uh, I think there was again in the New Statesman, I think one of the correspondents replying to a man who said, you know, 
I think it's very distasteful. Uh, you know, I, I want to have fun with my girlfriend. I don't want all these men having fun with each other. And, and the woman correspondent replies, well, you know, it, you may want to have your fun, but it's easy for you. You can have fun and nobody's going to jet. But actually watching people have sex in a park, whether it's heterosexual or homosexual, isn't something everybody wants. There's this film, I've forgotten the title for a second, I'm sure you'll remind me, with Dirk Bogard. And it's, is it from this period where he plays the lawyer who's been blackmailed? Yes. That, what's it, that's what's it called? Victim. Victim. Yes, really, it's 1961, really... so it's in right. volume two. Oh, <laughs> There's great, a lot okay. about it. Okay, okay. But I'm happy to talk about it. It's, um... Yeah, yeah, please. I, wa- I saw it maybe last year, and it's, um, it's really fascinating. It's, it's a bit, I think it's on YouTube. I mean, you, yeah, easily, easily accessible. And it's such an interesting um, historical artifact because the Bogard was, was gay, right, and was... It was again one of these actors where people sort of knew, but it wasn't public. Yes, well, it's hard to tell with Bogart because he denied it so vehemently for so many years, and in fact never really acknowledged it. I mean, the thing was that he was a great matinee idol with many, many female fans. Young women adored him in things like The Doctor in the House and various romantic dramas, um, and. In fact, it was very brave of him to take on this role as as a as a married but but basically gay barrister. Um, and um, the other, I mean, there are so many interesting things about that film because it was an example of how the British Board of Film Censors worked with filmmakers. The Lord Chamberlain's office that licensed plays for for production. So every play that was put on in a public theatre had to be have a license from the Lord Chamberlain's office. And they would basically say, send us the script. And then they would say, this is acceptable or this is not acceptable or this will be acceptable if you cut this, that and the other. And they would, wouldn't would really until 19, late 1950s accept even a mention of homosexuality or anything. That was absolutely taboo. The British Board of Film Censors worked entirely differently. They worked with filmmakers. And so they said, well, send us a synopsis and we'll say what we think and then send us a draft and um, Victim was written by a husband and wife team. Um, Janet Green was the, the principal writer, but her husband, John McCormick, also worked on the script with her. So it's interesting it was written by a heterosexual couple. Uh, and um, they sent back and forth and had great arguments with the British Board of Film Censors about what they could include. The British Board of Film Censors at one point said there are rather too many homosexuals in this film, which given it was a film about homosexuality and blackmail seemed rather odd. But in fact, they they did uh, a lot of the points they did eventually win. And so the, 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 the film is sort of very, very frank. The other thing about the film that is important, I think, is that it, it was filmed in London in very recognisable locations and the, the the gay men in it seemed in most ways sort of perfectly ordinary like anybody else. And p- prior to that, you know, gay people were in films as sort of screaming, hysterical theatricals and or, you know, sinister murderers or murder victims. Um, so it was interesting that that you know, part of the film, it, it, although it was a thriller, it was clearly a work of proselytism intended to, to contribute to the debate. And in fact, um, when the the um, the bill was finally passed, partially decriminalising homosexuality, Lord Aaron, who had um, piloted the bill through the House of Lords, wrote to Dirk Bogard. This would have been six years later after the film was released and said, you know, I think this film swung public opinion towards decriminalising homosexuality, and you should be proud that you've made this film, uh, and that now, we hope, people won't live in fear of blackmail as they had before, as they had in the period of the film. And blackmail, the the, the possibilities of, of blackmail for gay men who... You know, Either a blackmailer would say, right, we'll tell your employer unless you pay us, we'll tell your family unless you pay us. Uh, uh, And also, you know, if we'll report you to the police and you'll go to jail. Um, So by decriminalising homosexuality, you did remove much of the threat of blackmail. Um, obviously, people didn't want their families to know necessarily, but the, the, the sort of the, the blackmail that, you know, did lead people to commit suicide and go to into despair. Um, and a lot of um, 
a lot of the law change was to do with trying to eliminate black men. It was the great argument that one of the reasons homosexuality should be decriminalized was to put an end to blackmail, which was a, a, a worse uh, um, crime. And of course, gay men who were blackmailed people would say, well, why didn't they go to the police? But if they went to the police, they might incriminate themselves as homosexual and therefore be, be um, uh, you know, liable to prosecution. So it, it put them in a difficult position. But certainly there's quite a lot, you know, this film is all about blackmail and, and why, and there's quite a lot of speeches in it where people are saying, you know, did you know that all this, this um, blackmailing went on and this is disgraceful. Um, but it's, I think it stands up remarkably well. I've seen it many times and, and I think it's a, a, a very good film. <laughs>